If you have your Bibles, I hope you're there in Romans chapter 7. And uh, we need to remember one another in prayer. Many, many people have experienced pain and death and separation this week. Of course, Brother Tim, we are certainly praying for you and your family. Sorry to hear about the home going of your brother. Also, I know while I was away, there was a couple of girls from, I believe, Danville School that uh, passed away. Also, a girl just before I left over from Priceville. And so if anything that does, it reminds us of the brevity of life, the shortness of life. And the question that we asked all these Ghanaians as we were there in Ghana, the question we asked several times is, if you were to die today, do you know for sure that you would go to heaven? Or if you were to die today and stand before God and he was to ask you, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say to him? And so I put that question to you this morning. If you were to die right now, where none of us are promised another day, uh, a pastor friend of mine had to do the funeral of a 39-year-old lady this week. So I don't think that they were expecting her to die. I mean, 39 years old, you think prime of life, just before 40. I mean, certainly on this side of 40, you're okay. But um, she passed away. And so if you were to die today, and you were to stand before God, and he was to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? What would be your answer? Are you certain of the answer? Are you certain that the answer that you would give to God would be right? Would it be true? It was amazing to me how many people were convinced in Ghana that their good works would get them into heaven. They were completely convinced of it until we were able to take the Bible through the interpreter that we had with us and share what the Bible says. The Bible says it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saves, and he saves alone. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so it is good to be home, but we realize that when... Being even at home, people need to hear the good news. We, we did. We had a wonderful trip to Ghana to visit with our missionaries, Steve and Michelle Volante. They've been serving in Ghana now for about 20 years. They will celebrate their 20th anniversary for the ministry there this June. We were able to spend eight days with them and see many of these wonderful churches that have been planted as a result of that primary church plant there in Techiman. We had the chance, as we've mentioned, to see well over 100 souls pray to receive Christ as Savior in those short eight days that we were with them. Their churches saw over 510 souls pray to receive Christ on Easter Sunday this year. The culture there is uh, somewhat insulated from the outside world. It's not like our culture here. There's still a respect towards strangers there in that country. There's still a spirit of ho- hospitality. There's a basic fear of God, a meaning a fear of God, a reverence for God, an understanding that God exists. There's, a not, there's an acknowledgement amongst almost all Ghanaians that, that, uh, there is, uh, that the Bible is the word of God. So hearts are ready to receive the truth of the gospel there. And so... As I mentioned, Steve and Michelle were an inspiration to us along with all the other brothers and sisters in Christ there. Their pastors, I can't wait till tonight to share with you uh, just the highlights. Obviously, you'll be hearing more about it in the weeks to come. But I hope you'll be back tonight for that presentation at 6 p.m. Uh, it's my prayer that you'll hear the testimonies of our other two team members that went, both Pastor Tim Matthews and Brother Rusty Baker. And uh, I'm sure they'll have some good stories about me, but I get the last slot tonight. So I'll follow up with any good stories about them from the trip. But we just really want to share with you what we saw with our eyes and heard with our ears and experienced with our hands as we were there in Ghana. So I hope you'll be back tonight. In fact, for all the kids that are here tonight, we will have a special gift from Africa just for them. So maybe I should have said that when they were still in here. So they would, you know, say, Mom and Dad, we got to go tonight. we got to go. But you'll only get the gift if you're here tonight. And so the kids will have their Kids for Truth meeting as they normally do. But then they'll be cutting their activity time short, I believe, and be coming in here around 645. And we'll have a gift to present to them. So we would love to give your kids that gift from Africa just for them. And I believe you'll receive a gift and a blessing if you're back tonight at 6 p.m. We'll have several more photos to share with you. And so I hope that you can make it for that. Well, today we continue our series in the book of Romans, and so if you're there in Romans chapter 7, let's just do a quick review. What is the outline of the book of Romans? The outline of the book of Romans is that in chapters 1 through 3, 
God diagnoses the human condition very clearly, very uh, simply. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. It doesn't matter uh, what kind of religious background you have. In fact, the argument, argument can be made in Romans chapter 2 that the Jew, because they had the revelation of God's law, was even more inexcusable than the Gentile who might not have heard the specific revelation of God's law. So all are guilty. There is none righteous, no, not one, the Bible declares there in those first three chapters. And so God does a great job of diagnosing the real problem, and that is man is spiritually dead. Man's heart is a heart of stone. And so there was this need for a new covenant through the finished work, shed blood of Jesus Christ. He said, this is the new testament, the new covenant of my blood, which is shed for many. So Jesus was the mediator of a better covenant, the book of Hebrews says. And because of that, the new covenant, as Jeremiah 31 verse 31 says, was able to cut out the heart of stone and give to us a new heart through the new birth. We are made new creations by a new and living way. And because of the finished work of Jesus and his shed blood, by the way, shed once for all, we have access to the throne of grace, all God's people said. Amen. I'm thankful that we can come to that throne of grace in a time of need. I'm thankful that we have hope beyond this life. And I'm thankful that God diagnoses us accurately because it's when we see our diagnosis as it truly is that then we are ready for the deliverance that only He can offer. You see, the amazing, matchless, infinite, wonderful grace of God delivers us. And that's what God starts to unwrap right there at the end of chapter 3 when he says, but now there is a righteousness from God revealed. What kind of righteousness? It's not the righteousness which is of law keeping, but it is the righteousness through the finished perfect life of Jesus Christ. It's the righteousness of faith in him alone. And so we see that the gospel of God's grace has power to deliver us from sin's penalty. And we see that in chapters 4 and five, But then, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago before I left on my trip, we started talking about how this gospel is not just a great deliverance from sin's penalty, meaning spending eternity separated from God forever in a place called hell. I mean, aren't you thankful to be saved from sin's penalty? I know I am. And so that's wonderful. But, but the gospel is also about deliverance from sin's power today about seeing victory in our lives, about seeing this maturing process occurring. And so we asked this question a couple of weeks ago, and that is, how is the dominion of sin broken? But more properly, the question is this, how was the dominion of sin broken? Because you see, the gospel declares that through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ... We were identified with Christ through his death. We were raised to walk in newness of life. That's why we practice this thing called baptism is because it's an outward symbol of an inward reality of what's already happened in our hearts. And I'm sorry if I'm talking so fast, but I'm used to preaching with an interpreter and I want to get in as much as I can. Pastor Matthews thought I would come back and kind of stop every sentence. No, no, no. I feel free now. You know, I can preach and just preach. But anyway, um, so how was the dominion of sin broken? How was it? And, and, and so what the Bible calls us to constantly throughout the New Testament is to renew our minds to what has already happened in our spirit and what God wants to work from the inside to the outside. That's what God calls us to. Don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. How, church? By the renewing of your mind. To have the mind of Christ. To have the power of gospel-rooted thinking. Not the, this namby-pamby thing called the power of positive thinking. Yeah, there's preachers on TV that talk about that. But we're talking about the power of gospel-centered, Christ-exalted thinking. So what truly needs to change for us, what must truly change if we are to see lasting change? Our thinking must change. You see, you behave the way you behave because you believe the way you believe. And you believe the way you believe because you think the way you think. Let that sink in for a moment. As he thinketh in his heart, so what? So is he. So it all starts with thinking. 
It all starts with setting our mind on truth. And finally, brethren, what sort of things are true, just, honest, pure, lovely, of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise? Think on these things, because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And what he thinks about, he ends up believing. And how he believes, he ends up living out that belief through his behavior. But the church message in most churches today is, you better behave right. We're so worried about people not behaving that we somehow think we can change behavior. When we have child after child being lost to the world because we raise them up in a behavior-centric, behavior-change uh, 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 society where all we're giving to them is a list of morality, but there's no power behind it. We have a form of godliness, but we have denied the absolute power thereof. And so what happens today is we think Christianity is do better, try harder. That, can be, that, is, that can't be anywhere close to what the true gospel is. It is not do better, try harder. It is he did it all, trust in him, live through him, live daily by faith as his life is lived through you because he which hath begun a good work in you, he's the one that performs it till the day of Jesus Christ. And so what must truly change in our lives if we're going to see lasting change? First of all, our thinking must change. We heard about that a couple of weeks ago. And so we must determine to set our mind on the truth of the gospel. Right believing will always lead to right behavior. We are to cast down imaginations in every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And so right believing will lead to right behaving and right believing starts with right thinking and it's the right thinking upon the truth. What does God say in John 8, 32? Ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So today, I'm going to give you some truth, some truth that can set you free. But I hope that uh, I will not become your enemy because I have told you the truth. You see, Paul was, was, uh, he he said in Galatians 4.16, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Paul wasn't like because he preached the purity of the message of the gospel of God's grace. He was persecuted. He was falsely accused as being a licentious preacher because he, because he was so clear on the gospel, people actually ask questions such as, well, Paul, if I understand what you're saying, shouldn't we just go on sinning that grace may abound? And of course, Paul said, foolishness, God forbid. But the truth is the truth. And when you confront people with the truth, specifically when Paul confronted the Jewish religious mind with the truth, he was made to be their enemy. I hope that today you will understand that I am not your enemy. First and foremost, if you believed in Jesus Christ, I'm your brother. And I just want you to be on this journey with me as we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so we talked about a few weeks ago what we must know. We must know who we are in. We must know that now we have been placed in Christ because of our faith in Him. We have been made a new creation. Christ is in us. We are in Christ. We abide in Him. And so Romans chapter 6 says, Brethren, know that you've been buried with Him. You've been raised together with Him. Know this to be the truth. Set your mind on that truth. Number two, know what you are under. And that brings us back to Romans 6.14 today. The Bible says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? Why? Because you are not under law, but under grace. What does that verse mean? What does it mean? The Bible says sin should no longer have dominion over you. That word dominion means to exercise authority, control. Are you saved here this morning and you feel like after you got saved, sin still has control? It still, some, to some level, exerts authority over you. You feel like it's got a hold of you rather than you've got a hold of it. Do you feel that way? Then to a certain degree, to a certain extent, you have not set your mind on the truth and you're not believing that truth. And so today, change your mind. I ask you at the beginning of this message to change your mind. Repent. That's what the word repent means. Change your mind to what the truth of the gospel says. Because the Bible says... If there is any hope for you to ever live free from the authority of sin in your life, you must not be under the law, but you must be under grace. That is our only hope. 
The only hope for us ever living in freedom from sin is to get away from living under the law. But, 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 well, what, what does the Bible say happens when we're under the law? Under the law, sin is exposed, Romans 3, verse 20. Under the law, sin is aroused, Romans 7, verse 9. Under the law, sin is only reinforced, 1 Corinthians 15, 56. And under the law, sin is condemned. The law was a good diagnostician. It diagnoses us as what? The law hath concluded all under sin. The law is a great mirror to show us an accurate reflection of who we were before we placed faith in Christ. But the law has no power to actually clean our lives up. It was only able to bring us to the end of ourselves to show us our need for Christ. The Bible says it like this in Galatians 3, that it was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. And so, under the law, sin was exposed, it was aroused, it was only reinforced, and sin is only condemned by the law. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is found in the law. The law only served the purpose of diagnosing us as a sinner. It cannot do anything to actually deliver us from sin or keep us from sinning once we have been delivered. Only grace transforms the heart. Only grace teaches and instructs the life. And only grace matures the believer. Find a verse in the New Testament that says the law is what teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly worldly lust. No, it's grace that teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Find a verse in the Bible, uh, find a verse in the New Testament, even specifically, that says the law is the thing that matures us. When the Bible clearly says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. John 1, 17 is clear. The law was given by Moses and we're thankful for Moses. We're thankful for the fact that Moses was a servant in all his house, but he wasn't a son. And Hebrews chapter 3 says, the son is greater than the servant. We're thankful for Moses. We're thankful for the revelation that he gave. We're thankful that through Moses, we were, we were fully convinced of the fact that we were sinners. But there was a greater revelation to come. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And so Jesus Christ was the final revelation of what God had been revealing since Genesis 3.15. He was the revelation of the fullness of God's grace and truth. As it is in truth, God is full of grace. And you see grace all throughout the Old Testament. You see it more fully revealed, of course, in the New Testament, in the fullness of who Jesus is. And you see Jesus giving mercy... To the woman caught in adultery. You see Jesus giving mercy to his disciples who were charged with breaking the law when they were picking ears of wheat from the field. And he quoted the Old Testament story about David eating from the table of showbread. And Jesus said, well, guys, you've missed the whole point of the law. The law was to reveal me who would be the perfect law keeper, by the way, and he did. And so we see that if we truly want the world to change, then we'll start believing and proclaiming the grace of God. Yes, because under grace, sin is forgiven forever. Under grace, sin is forgotten forever. Sin is replaced with His righteousness under grace, and sin is broken of its power. And I want to quote this verse here because it's going to come up later in our study. It says, We love Him because He first loved us in 1 John four nineteen. So why do we love Him? Because He first loved us. What is grace? Grace is the undeserved, unmerited favor, the love of God poured upon us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do you believe that today? Have you received that? You see, the world is waiting for the children of God to step into their sonship, to step into this reality of what God has declared them to be, that they are forgiven, that they have been given the Spirit of God, that they, you know, sometimes we look at the book of Acts chapter 2 and we're like, man... 3,000 people saved in one day. That sounds like a lot. Man, God sure isn't doing that today. Do you realize every 54 minutes in the world today, 3,000 people are coming to trust Christ as Savior? We serve a powerful God. We serve a God who is active at work in the world today. But yet yet Romans 8 verse 19 says that the creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. The manifestation of who we are in Christ. And so God is calling us to faith. 
faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. To believe these things are true. And so God's grace must change us first if we ever hope for it to change the world. Because it is the goodness of God that leads us to truly change, to true repentance. It is the love of Christ that constrains us and motivates us. We love him because he first loved us. And so sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law but under grace. But what we do is we get into Romans chapter 7. And what Paul is going to do in Romans 7 verses 1 through 13 is he's going to expound upon that verse from Romans 6, 14. And I want you to see how he connects it. In Romans 6, 14, God says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. But look at verse 7, or chapter 7, verse 1. Know ye not, brethren. Now, Paul, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uses a similar phrase that he did at the beginning of chapter 6, verse 3. So he comes back to this form and he says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion, there's that word dominion from verse 14 of chapter 6, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Now, we're just going to go verse by verse for several uh, minutes, and I want to explain these verses to you so that we get a great understanding of the passage, so that we then get an accurate application of the passage. In this first verse, Paul basically says, Brethren, do you not know that the law has dominion over a man as long as he liveth? Let's illustrate it this way. If I were to get in my car this morning after church and I was to go tearing down Danville Road at 120 miles an hour, I could do that. How many of you would agree that's not the smartest thing to do on Danville Road? Raise the hands. Okay, good, good. So I could go tearing down the road on Danville Road at 120 miles an hour after church and I will definitely die. If I do that, there's no way I will survive going 120 miles down Danville Road this afternoon. Now, let's say as I was going down that road, a police officer saw me going 120 miles an hour. Woo! He turns on the lights, he starts chasing me, and then I get to that corner, you know, the corner where everybody has the wrecks. I get to that corner, and man, I can't hold it, and I go slamming into a tree, and I die. Question, is the police officer going to pull up to that mangled wreck of a car and start to write a traffic citation? And give to me a ticket? No. Because he understands the truth of this verse. The law exercises authority over a man as long as he lives. Did I break the law? Oh, I sure did. But if I die in the midst of my breaking of the law, there's no more... it's, It's not like the county will send my wife a citation for me breaking the speed limit. Why? Because I'm dead. There's no more authority that that law has. And that's what Paul is meaning here in Romans 7 verse 1. Let's continue reading. Verse 2. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Paul was citing a common knowledge of a uh, truth here of the permanence of marriage from from this time period. Both in Roman law and in Jewish law, there was this understanding that marriage was meant to be. Not that there weren't situations where, 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 where there was a putting away. Of course, Joseph had thought to put away Mary, his wife, privately because he assumed that she had been unfaithful during their betrothal period. But there was a common understanding that there was a permanence in marriage because of these laws that were written. And so the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. What's Paul saying? He's saying as long as that husband's alive, she's bound by law to that husband. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Continue reading, verse 3. So then if while her husband liveth she be married to another man... She shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now, what is, what's being argued here? Simply, that as long as you both shall live, God sees you as married in his sight. Upon death, you are free from that covenant, you are free from that commitment to go and marry another, and you will not be seen as an adulteress. Now, what's amazing to me is most of my life I've heard these two verses, verse 2 and verse 3, preached upon and ran to. And I'm not negating that they're there. And it's a great teaching on what should be the permanence of marriage till death do us part. 
However, what Paul is doing here is he's using this as an illustration of something bigger. And what's amazing to me is we will have men go to these two verses, pull them and preach upon them, and it's only those two verses, but you don't look at anything in the context. Why did Paul give this illustration? Ah, let's keep reading. Verse 4. Wherefore? Now that's huge. If you know me, that, that, that's, that, that's huge as you seek to understand the Bible. So Paul just gave this common argument that everybody would understand. And he says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. So what's Paul saying? He's saying, listen, you were married to the law. The law owned you. The law exercised dominion over you. And as long as the law and you still live, you are bound by that law. You are bound to the law of Moses. And you might say, are you sure it's the law of Moses? If you keep reading, Paul mentions the context of the law. Uh, no, 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 pastor. This is only talking about the ceremonial law. This is only talking about the sacrificial law. We'll keep reading. Look down at verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? No, God forbid. See, Paul had to answer that question because he just made such a powerful argument that some people assumed that he was saying the law is sinful. No, it's not. I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust except the law. And what law was he talking about? Thou shalt not covet. Where is thou shalt not covet found? The Big Ten, the Ten Commandments. So what Paul is doing, back to verse 4, he's saying, listen, you're in this relationship with the law. You are married to the law. It is exercising dominion and authority over you. And as long as you are under law, sin has power. Why? Because it's not that the law is sinful, but I am carnal, sold under sin, Romans 7, 14. So Paul says the only way you can get out of this agreement with the law is one of you has to die. And here's the thing about the law. It's perfect. It will never die. And so how were you released from the law? Verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. And this verse ties right back in to Romans 3, 6, verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us, as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? So we were planted together in the likeness of his death, that we should also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Our old man was crucified with him, the Bible says. And so it says we were become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Why? That we should be joined or married to another. And who are we married to? Even to him who is raised from the dead, Jesus, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh... The motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. So the only fruit that being married to the first husband, the law, brought was death. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. And the law hath concluded all under sin. And so the Bible says here that through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, as we have placed our faith in Him... We now have been freed from that old husband, if you will, follow the illustration. We've been freed from the old husband through our death with Christ, and we've been joined to Christ. That's the argument that Paul's making. And just in case we're not sure that that's the argument that the Holy Spirit is making through Paul, look at verse 6. But now we are delivered from the law. That word delivered is a military term. It means to be absolutely set free from. It means to be released. We are delivered from the law. That being dead wherein we were held. That we should serve in newness of spirit. And not in the oldness of the letter. And of course Paul was so clear on this. That he then had to answer the question that everybody had on their mind. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. No, I had not known sin but by the law. So the law was necessary. It was added, why? Because of transgressions till the seed should come. Galatians 3.19.
So it was added. Why was it added? It was added to show us our desperate need for a deliverer. It was added to diagnose us as what we truly are. We are self-righteous hypocrites who continue to fool ourselves into thinking that we can be good enough to be like God. But we can't. He says in verse 8, But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought me all manner of concupiscence, all manners of sins. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. I think this verse, along with several others, as we get on into Romans 7, as we'll do in the weeks to follow, I think Paul was clearly a believer here. He had been saved on the road to Damascus. God had saved him completely apart from any works of the law, as he says in Philippians 3, verse 9. He had been saved from, uh, by God's grace and God's grace alone. But as an old school Pharisee, Pharisee of the Pharisees, Paul then creeped back into law keeping, attempting to keep the law. And he had this struggle in his life, this struggle of covetousness that he just couldn't get over. He he was blameless in every other area, he says, over in Philippians 3. But he had a secret sin. He wanted your stuff. He wanted my stuff. He was covetous at heart. You know, a person who lives by the law can put on a great show Sunday morning in church. We got our nice clothes on. We're cleaned up. We even smell halfway decent. Not sure about the Bama fans. I'm just kidding. So, so we uh, had to get that in. Um, and so we, you know, look halfway decent. Living under law doesn't allow you to be honest. Living under the law makes you look good on the outside, but as Jesus said... You're full of dead men's bones on the inside. Law keepers are great at washing the outside of the tomb. And Paul looked blameless according to the law, as he says in Philippians 3. He says, hey, as touching the law, I was blameless. But yet here he says he was covetous at heart. Keep reading, Romans 7, verses 10 and 11. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment. What does that mean? Have you ever told a kid not to touch something? You you put a sign maybe on, don't touch the flowers. And the moment you tell them not to touch the flowers, what do they want to start doing? They want to try to get as close to not touching the flowers as they can without touching them. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Wives, how many of you have ever told your husbands, don't eat any of the chocolate pie before supper? Then you find a little scoop taken out with their finger. Like, who did that? Well, I don't know. Maybe the kids did, you know. The moment you tell somebody to do something or tell somebody not to do something, they want to do it. That's what this verse is saying here. But verse 12 says, Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Paul's answering the uh, question he asked in verse 7 a little bit deeper. He says, what shall we say then? Is law sin? God forbid. No, wherefore, the law is holy, the, the commandment holy and just and good. Why? Because the laws in some way reveal to us the set-apartness of who God is. Of course, God is not uh, somebody who is touched with sin. He cannot sin. And so in that way, the law was good. The law was holy. There's nothing wrong with the law. Hebrews 8, verses 6 through 13 tells us where the problem was. The problem was with us. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin. You see, sin is sly. Sin is subtle. Sin will masquerade itself as righteousness. As good. When Adam and Eve were tempted, I'm going to come back to this here in a little bit, but when Adam and Eve were tempted to take of that tree, do you realize that the temptation in their minds, I'm not saying I agree, but but in their minds it was actually a good thing. They could then discern good from evil. They could know the difference between right and wrong. And what did God call them to do? Just believe him by faith, believe that he was enough. Obey him in one simple area. And yet they could not. Satan was subtle with that, as we'll see here in a few moments. But the commandments were given to show that we might become exceeding sinful. 
So as you put these verses together and you really study the context and the argument of what Paul is doing as he's going from Romans 6.14 saying the only hope for sin ever being released of its power over you is to no longer be under the law but to be under grace. So he expounds upon that in Romans 7 verses 1 through 13. And he says, brethren, know ye not how that the law hath dominion over man as long as he liveth. And then he uses this marriage illustration and he comes to some conclusions in verse 4 and verse 6. He says, you are dead to the law by the body of Christ, verse 6, but now you are delivered from the law. So what's the application? Here it is up on the screen. I would encourage you to write this down because this is the application from this passage of Scripture. The law's primary function was to cause us to long for and bring us to a better husband. And his name is Jesus. What are we referred to in the Bible as church? The bride of Christ, who is Jesus. He is the bridegroom. A husband, Jesus is a good husband that does not need to intimidate through fear of obligation. But he is a husband that can motivate through his infinite, inexhaustible love and produce in us a loving loyalty to Christ. That is the argument that Paul is making here in Romans chapter 7. He's saying that as long as we try to live with two husbands, we are committing spiritual adultery. But I thought that spiritual adultery was only about loving the world and, and uh, you know, they're there in the book of James. That is one application. You can be a spiritual adulterer if you love the world and the things that are in the world. But here, Romans 7 is making the argument that also spiritual adultery is when we try to live with two husbands. When Jesus rescues us from the old husband... The husband that said, do or die. And we couldn't do, therefore we died. The law has concluded all under sin. And because of that, death comes to every man for that all have sinned. What is sin? It's the transgression of the law. So that husband was there. That husband was perfecting. Uh, uh, that, that husband expected perfection and nothing less. Ladies, you ever experienced that before? Now don't raise your hands. Have you ever been in a relationship where it's perfection and nothing else and there's no love in the relationship? There was only this constant fear of obligation? Listen, when people touched the mountain of Sinai, they died. When animals touched it, they died. Study it. Before Sinai, those people were just as much complainers as they were before the law was given and yet none of them died. After Sinai, people died left and right over and over and over. Why? What had changed? A covenant had changed. God's law had been enacted. And the wages of sin is death. And so this law came into play. This law came into fruition. Wherefore, my brethren, you're also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So the law's primary function was to cause us to long for and bring us to a better husband. A husband that could motivate us through his infinite and exhaustible love and grace and produce in us a loving loyalty to Christ. Why do I love God? Because he first loved me. The love of Christ constrains me. What am I motivated by as a believer in Christ today? I'm motivated to go out and follow the Lord in loving submission and obedience because he loved me enough to die for me, to give himself for me, and to bring me out from that bondage that I could never see victory in. Galatians 5 verse 6 says, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. And you might say, well, see, pastor... God's just referring to circumcision there. You know, that's just the, just the civil law or the uh, ceremonial law for the nation of Israel. Go back a few verses, Galatians 5 verse 3. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. People will say, well, people who preach the grace of God, they're antinomian. No, who's the true antinomian? The one that picks and chooses the laws that he thinks he can follow. 
The one who says that really the law is just meant to be there for us to improve ourselves. When the law is very clear, it kills us. The letter kills, we see here in this passage, but the Spirit gives life. And the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Do you realize that you could follow all the Old Testament laws and yet not have love, not have joy, not have peace? You could follow all those to the perfect T, but yet not have anything internally. What God did is He gave you a better husband that changes you from the inside out. He changes you. So Jesus, your new husband, the one who you are now in spiritual union with, is not impressed with our attempts to please him through an ongoing relationship with our old husband, the law. That's the argument that Paul's making here in Romans 7. Jesus died that you might die with him and be freed from the tyranny of your flesh, stirred up by the law. He desires to impart life to you that you might bear forth fruit unto God by the Spirit of God. The greatest constraining power against sin is love, not law. We were designed as new creations in Him to abide in Him and bear much fruit. I am not under the law, and as a Christian, I never will be again. <gasps> Does that mean you're lawless? No, I've been called to something called the law of Christ, Galatians 6 2. Brethren, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And we don't have time to go into that, but there's two simple laws in the law of Christ the law of faith. And the law of love, the royal law, as James refers to it. And so, when I love my brethren, of course I'm not going to commit adultery. Of course I'm not going to covet. Of course I'm not going to steal. Of course I'm not going to bear false witness. Why? Because love is the fulfilling of the law. And Jesus came, he kept the old, thus delivering us from it, calling us to something greater, which supersedes it which actually gives us victory over sin because under law, sin controls, sin holds, it, dem it exercises dominion. But under grace, we are no longer under the dominion of sin. And so the law of Christ is simply to believe. So it's not that we're lawless. It not, it, it, it's not that we're released from the old husband and joined to a new husband and there's nothing. No, there's loving loyalty. And that's what I've been trying to preach as we go through this book of Romans here, specifically in this passage, because these are great truths that will set us free if we believe them by faith. And so the question this morning as we close is, which husband are you trying to please? Which husband are you trying to please? Which spouse are you trying to please? Listen closely to 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband. One, not two. That I present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear. What was the fear? I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve. What did the serpent say to Eve? You need more. Eve, you need to be able to discern for yourself the difference between right and wrong. Eve, you need morality. Eve, you need to establish your own righteousness so that you don't need God. You can become like God because then you'll know good from evil. Do you see the lie? And do you see the lie that Satan continues to blind even Christians to today? The lie that says you can honor Jesus and still please the old husband. It is absolutely impossible. And so the serpent beguiled Eve away from the simplicity. What was the simplicity in Christ? Believe he's enough. Believe that he had given you freedom beyond understanding. They had every tree in the garden except one. So tell me, did Adam and Eve have a list of 10 rules? Did they have a list of 613? No. Do you realize human history did not have 613 laws for almost 3,000 years before Sinai? How did Joseph know how to please God? He didn't have the law. 
How did Abraham know how to please God? How did Noah know how to please God? How did any of those people know how to please God? Because they did not have what was given at Sinai. Oh, that must tell me there's something else there that will produce loving loyalty to God. So I beg you, consider the truth of what the Holy Spirit is arguing for here in Romans chapter 7. You see, Christian, my brother and sister in Christ, some of the greatest repenting that you and I will ever do is when we finally change our mind about our relationship to a law that was ever only temporary, could never bring life, and was only given to us to bring us to a greater relationship with a new husband. So what does that mean? What does that mean for you and I? You see, the law is not of faith, Galatians 3.12 says. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And so Satan's main strategy today is not to try to get us to sin. Follow me. His main strategy is to try to get us to keep the law in our flesh, to walk according to the flesh, to think that we can do it, to think that we bring, uh, we can gain God's favor through our law keeping. And that's the lie of the devil. And that is what sinks us deeper and deeper into powerless Christianity today. The number one deception of the devil that he used with Eve was to get her to believe that she could be like God without God. That if she could just have the knowledge of right and wrong, she wouldn't need God. She was told that she could be good without God. And unfortunately, that is most of the world today. In most churches today, you'll hear about being good. Be good Christians. Be well-behaved Christians. And I'm not saying that we will not have right behavior. But right behavior is the fruit of the right belief the right thinking, the right knowledge. And God says here, Know ye not, brethren, that you have been released from the old and you have been joined to the new. The old could only motivate you through fear and intimidation and fear and intimidation only work so far. But the new husband can transform you and motivate you to a life of loving loyalty. And oh yeah, by the way, You'll fulfill all that other stuff in the process. Isn't that good news? Isn't it good news that you have a new husband that you've been joined to? And by the way, that husband will never leave you nor forsake you. No matter how many times you fail or might falter. Look at the book of Hosea and see God's heart for you. Hosea was a prophet from the Old Testament, married to a lady by the name of Gomer, who over and over went out and committed adultery against him. But he kept going back to her. He kept buying her back from the auction slave block. Talk about faithfulness. Talk about loving loyalty. Talk about till death do us part. That's what Jesus has promised for you. And when you see the gospel in all of its glorious grace, it wells up within you a desire to want to follow hard after Jesus. Let's pray together.